Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Candace Perlstein. I am the Associate Director of Jewish Partnerships for ADL. Uh, before I say too much else, since this is the first time we're doing Q&A through an app, I want to let you all know how to submit questions so you can submit them through the program. I'm going to change the screen right Oh, if you can see that. Uh, so if you want to submit a question on the app towards the bottom, that way as well. Just wanted to share that before we get too far into it. So again, my name is Candace Perlstein. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm excited to dive into this important conversation about what we are seeing on our college campuses uh, and know that you're eager to hear from our esteemed panelists. So before we get into it, I'd love to turn it over to them to introduce themselves. Starting with me? Starting with you, Tom. I'm assuming you can all hear me. I'm loud anyway. Uh, I'm Tom Way. I am the head of global strategy for Chabad on Campus International. And Chabad on Campus International is the umbrella organization for the Chabad on Campus network. We reach approximately 150,000 Jewish students every year on campus. And we do that through 800 plus campuses. Uh, served through around 370 full-time locations and other satellite locations. Uh, and this is staffed by our network of educators, rabbis, and rebbitzins of approximately 850 people. Thanks, Tom. Hi, I'm Sarah Freed. I'm Hillel's Chief External Affairs Officer. Uh, Hillel International works with uh, 850 campuses around the country and around the world. We operate in 16 countries as the world's largest Jewish college organization. We have over 1,000 professionals in our field. They engage 180,000 Jewish students annually, building vibrant, strong Jewish life on campus and deepening connections for Jewish students uh, both on and off campus. Uh, we are a 100-year-old organization. We're actually celebrating our centennial this year um, and have spent the past decades uh, seeing this trend of rising anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism and building significant capacity across our teams to address this through our Israel Action and Addressing Anti-Semitism Program and our Campus Climate Initiative. Good morning. Hi, my name is Miriam Tenenbaum. I am the Vice President of Development for Olami. I like to say that Olami is the Jewish world's best kept secret. We are a Jewish engagement organization uh, with over 300 chapters around the world uh, in over 20 countries, and we work with over 60,000 uh, primarily college students and young professionals um, using innovative means of engagement to inspire young Jews to connect with their Judaism, build Jewish pride, and ensure Jewish continuity. Thank you for your time today and looking forward to sharing more over this panel. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Waits. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Alpha Epsilon Pi. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're on 150 college campuses in the United States, Canada, the UK, and Israel. We have 8,500 members. And this year alone, um, we've engaged over almost a half million people on college campuses um, with the programming that we're doing um, Jewish, Israel, combining, um, combating anti-Semitism, and uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, thanks to Candace, who I've had the pleasure of hosting uh, a few times over the last few months with AEPI events. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, so before I jump into questions with the panel, I'd like to just paint a picture from a data perspective of what we are seeing on campus. So since October 7th, ADL has recorded... Can't, they can't hear me. Oh, oh. Can you hear me now? Yeah, sort of, not yet. I'll, yeah, now it's on. I'm going to try and project into the microphone and hope that then it further projects. Can everyone sort of hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So since October 7th, ADL has recorded 746 anti-Semitic incidents on campus. For a little perspective, that's a 750% increase in what we saw the same time last year. We also know a lot of incidents go unreported, especially on college campuses, so that likely does not paint a full picture of what our students are experiencing. 
In fact, we did a joint climate cam campus climate study with Hillel and saw that 75% of students had either experienced or witnessed anti-Semitism in the school year. And additionally, 70% of students surveyed, both Jewish and non-Jewish, felt like their campus was not doing enough to address the issue of combating anti-Semitism. So with that picture painted in numbers, Tom, can you give life to some of that data? What, what have you seen on campus since October 7th? So my colleague and I here, uh, we were on a panel last week, and the data is overwhelming. Uh, ADL, Chabad, Hillel, others, we are tracking the data, but I think what really bears fruit right now and something that if you look at me and you see that today I left my hat and my beard at home, I am not your traditional Chabad <coughs> guy sitting in front of you, um, but this speaks to what we're all trying to do. We're trying to embrace every single Jew on campus. And instead of focusing right now on the darkness, we really want to focus on the light. And, and what we see happening on campus is more partnering. Uh, today, later in the day, you will hear about a collaboration being launched between Chabad on campus and the ADL. Uh, the anti-Semitism campus task force was launched two and a half years ago to address these issues. So what are we talking about? We're talking about all of the bad you've heard heard about, but now focusing on the light. So Chabad at Harvard, we heard all of the bad. Uh, a week ago, we had uh, Ishai Rebo in concert there, right? He shows up, and he had, there were over 100 protesters trying to keep Ishai Rebo away. The community responded beautifully, beautifully to this, and there were two incredible concerts. Uh, at UC Berkeley, we saw all of us, saw what happened there last week when Ron Bar Yehoshaphat came to speak. And not only was he barred, but there were violent protests, glass broken, a student almost strangled. It moved away from campus, ended up off campus at the Chabad house. It could have been Hillel, it could have been anywhere. The point is, there was another place for him to go. And now, on the 18th, we're bringing him back to campus. And we're standing up for our rights and we're standing up for Judaism. And the, uh, very early on, two weeks into all of this craziness at the University of Arizona, I get a phone call from the Chabad rabbi there that said, uh, I'm very disturbed. I was told that I can't table on campus uh, because I'm not an admitted student group. And I said, but why is SJP able to table on campus and they're not yet an admitted student group? And he was told by someone in the office that Hamas has the right to a voice on campus. Right? Hamas has the right to a voice on campus. It so happened that that's not what they meant. They meant that SJP, but they couldn't even differentiate at that point. So when, when no one out there can differentiate against an organization that's caused harm to the Jewish people, that's caused harm to Israel, and those that are trying, arguably, to have a voice, uh, then we're in bigger issues. He reached out to his local assemblyman, assemblywoman, who reached out to the university. In one day, it was solved. So what's my point in all of this? There is so much light out there. We don't back down. We don't stand aside. For too many years, we couldn't be lawyers. We couldn't be doctors. We didn't have a right to be what we needed to be in the world and in this country. And on Hanukkah, what do we do? Where do we put the menorah? Where do we put the Hanukkiah? In the window. Why do we put it in the window? To shine a bright light for everyone to see, for us to stand up, and to say, Am Yisrael. Chai. So the conclusion here is that it's not all dark. There's a lot of light. If I can just paint a little bit of color, though, Tom, and I think you know, you and I did sit on this panel last week, and the numbers were stark. Um, we, we work, Hillel International developed a partnership uh, nearly three years ago now with ADL. We've been tracking anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism activity for two decades now. Uh, about three years ago, we developed a partnership that is where ADL's primary set of numbers are coming from, and now in a growing relationship with Chabad on campus as well. But our records, because we, we track in real time, and then we, we uh, 
reconcile later, we're at over 1,000 incidents of anti-Semitism on college campuses. When Hillel started tracking, we had 24 incidences in one year. So the remarkable difference, 48 of those were physical assaults. There were zero. So it's important, I do think, for this audience to know, and we're going to talk about the ways in which we're addressing this and these organizations on this panel are making a real difference in the lives of students. But it is important for this audience to be aware that we have a real problem on campus, that students, our students, many of your students, my daughter is a junior at Syracuse University, I know firsthand how she's experienced this, that these incidents are real, it's a lived experience that this generation is, is having to deal with, and how critical the work is that we're gonna talk about happening. Thank you, and I, I just wanna add, um, just to, to add to, to your um, observations on the stage, prior to October 7th, Ola Me, our organization is focused on reaching unaffiliated, disengaged young Jews. And so prior to October 7th, we actually did not do much work in the space of Israel advocacy or combating anti-Semitism. There are other amazing organizations that are in this space and doing wonderful work. And, um, and we were focused on spreading the light of Judaism and making young Jews understand why it's important to build strong Jewish connections and community and identity. And, and, um, and that, was, that was where our strengths were. And after October 7th, what we realized, first of all, um, our students, we, we saw a surge in, in engagement. Young Jews who had never considered walking into any Jewish institution on campus were coming out because October 7th, for good or for bad, forced them to reckon with their Jewish identity. And this was something that we understood as a moment that we now have a, an incredible opportunity, but more so responsibility, to seize this moment where young Jews are coming in and they're scared. And they, there's, there's so much going on on campus. They are serving on the front lines um, in, this, in this war against anti-Semitism. And we have the opportunity to build up these young Jews and not make them, not, not have a reactive response, but enable them and empower them to be proactive on campus, to not only grow in their Jewish pride and identity, but also to go out to their peers and their friends on campus and share the light of Judaism so that when we're, when we're talking about administration getting involved, we don't even have to get there because the entire campus culture is they're right along with their Jewish friends and saying no to anti-Semitism and building a zero tolerance campaign from the grassroots level. So when you are listening to all these incidents that are taking place, I, I, I want to hold the moment because it is also something that we are able to make, to turn to a positive and take these incidents and give the students the tools to do better for themselves for the Jewish people, for the Jewish future, and, uh, and I'm excited to share with you soon more about our efforts in this space with our Zero Tolerance campaign. Thank you, Miriam. And sort of building on the idea of coalition building, Michael, could you perhaps share a little bit what you've seen from non-Jewish allies? I know especially in the Greek life world, have you seen support for the community? <clears throat> on October 7th, uh, my colleague Ethan White called me and said, what's campus gonna look like in two hours, tomorrow, the next week, the rest of the semester? And we saw, since August, rise in anti-Semitism, starting with our Berkeley chapter, um, with shrimp being thrown at the house. And we saw allies, friends from other fraternities, sororities on campus, come to us, how can we help? 15 years ago, my, my first day on the job at AEPI, I don't think I would see that, but now we're seeing organizations and students, administrators, faculty and staff coming to us and saying, what can we do? How can we partner further together? And just 10 days ago, we launched um, our pet petition initiative. When things happen on campus, uh, we're having our undergraduate brothers, our alumni, our parents, our friends, and other student organizations on campus help get the word out there 
um, just last week at University of British Columbia um, with Hillel. Um, the student government tried taking it that Hillel should lose their space on campus, and AEPI and Hillel worked together, sending our petition out, and it didn't pass. And we've seen this happen 10 times now, every single time it didn't pass. And last night in Abagani County in Pennsylvania, uh, the councilwoman who brought up uh, the ceasefire mentions that she was bombarded with emails from national organizations on this topic. Last night, it, it didn't pass. They had only two voting yes and nine voting no. And we're seeing allies getting behind this and wanting to support on a national level, getting the word out there about how to help Jewish students on campus, how to talk to school administrators, Congress senators about IRA definition and getting that past eight campuses. And it's better than what we anticipated. And really going off of numbers and what things look like, on October 17th, AEPI hosted a day of strength. We had 81 chapters participate, doing a march, um, doing conversations in partnership with Hillel's on campus and Chabad on campus. We had 30,000 30, people show up. It's a fraction are Jewish. But we're bringing the non-Jewish students out there and educating them on Israel on anti-Semitism, on anti-Zionism, and what they're saying to us is, we need more education. I go to Candace, I go to Dovi, we need more stuff, more stuff to give to them. And in December, for Shine a Light, we hosted a panel where, where Candace sat on. We, had a, we hosted over 150 school administrators, presidents, senior vice presidents, uh, dean of the law schools, and we started offering our anti-Semitism e-learning that is for our undergraduate brothers. We opened it up to, to school administrators. In the first week, we had over 200 take the course. So our goal is continue educating and build, bringing in more allies with what we're doing. And everyone is standing with us, standing by our side, wanting to partner with us and help the Jewish community. And that's the most important thing right now. Yes, yeah, Sarah, I would love if you could maybe even go a little deeper there on the education piece. Um, I, know, I know from a personal perspective, like I have had so much to learn in order to be able to speak to these like very nuanced topics. So putting myself in the space of a college student, going into these conversations on Israel and anti-Zionism with their peers, like what are we doing to educate them to have those conversations? It's a great question. And I think I really agree with the fellow panelists in terms of education being one of the key tools in terms of shifting tides. Um, there's a few ways that Hillel has been working to address this. First, uh, this spring we launched a teach-in series. We're gonna reach uh, over 100 campuses. This is bringing experts um, on the Middle East, experts on the situation that's happening. One of the things we're hearing from students is a desire to engage with real content, not to be in shouting matches, but to be in real dialogue and understand from real experts what's actually happening both on the ground now and how did we get here. So one is around a teach-in tour that we've launched. Um, so that is one of our significant new spring initiatives. Um, but prior to that, we work with a network of students, uh, our Israel Leadership Network, that brings together student leaders from each of our campuses. We have uh, 150 campuses represented, and they then in turn work with their student bodies in terms of bringing educational resources, uh, different ways to engage with Israel, different ways to um, engage in the topic. We had 800 of these students come together just uh, two weeks ago in Atlanta. Um, it was incredible to be able to actually watch the students take a breath of fresh air. For many of them, it was the, the first time they had felt uh, in a, being in a room that was surrounded by people that were like-minded, that could think. And by the way, they were nuanced and they were deep and they were thoughtful. Um, our students are incredible, by the way. All of our students are incredible. But they were, they were hungry for education. They were hungry for masterclass series. And so this is a key way in which we're addressing it with students. 
Um, and I'm happy to talk more, Candice, in terms of how we're addressing this with university administrators uh, as well, because there's a key part of education that's going to be critical. Yeah, I think that's such an important point, especially as we see these numbers of incidents trending in the wrong direction. Are, are we seeing administrators respond with a sense of urgency? So I think we have to talk about university administrators <laughs> and presidents, right? The elephant in the room. There is no question that leadership starts at the top. Um, we knew that prior to October 7th. Uh, it's even more important now. Uh, Hillel's been working deeply with university administrators and presidents uh, for many decades, clearly as we are built into the fabric of uh, higher education and most of our executive directors have deep, meaningful relationships with their university presidents. But in a more concerted and constructive effort, about three and a half years ago, we launched our Campus Climate Initiative. This year alone, we'll train over a thousand university presidents and administrators um, to really do deep work on their campus to assess what is their climate and how can they improve it. That said, that's long-term work and we need quick action. So there's a few ways that we've been addressing that and in, actually in partnership with ADL that we started to see some changes that give us hope in the months ahead. Um, we launched a call line. You, you actually can't call call, but it is a uh, online tool that is a legal tool. Um, and part of this, we did it in partnership with ADL, the Brandeis Center and Gibson and Dunn uh, legal team. And part of this is to put pressure on university administrators to understand that there are consequences if they do not speak out on their campuses. So I know many of you uh, hopefully were at the morning plenary where uh, Deborah Lipstadt spoke about uh, California University, which I will name, which was Berkeley, where the first statement that came out a week ago was dismal. Second statement should have been the first. Named anti-Semitism was much stronger. And just uh, two weeks ago, we saw President Kornbluth from MIT. I'm sure many of you remember her in the congressional hearing this past December. Who can forget? Uh, just two weeks ago, she... Uh, she uh, asked the campus uh, group, um, and I have to say their name because they're an offshoot of um, the Students for Justice in Palestine. They call it the Coalition Against Apartheid. She, uh, it's a registered student group. She suspended them, finally, for violating campus policy. And this is a direct correlation. Uh, MIT has been part of our campus climate initiative where they learned the tools that they needed to share, best, share their university policies and procedures with all students, which they did at the start of their winter term. And when this student group violated those, they suspended them. And we need to see this action happening. It's not enough. There's too few, incident, uh, too few incidents of this that I could point to, but we are starting to see some change. Uh, so just to underscore a couple of things that Sarah just mentioned, and I, I think it's a critical element. Hillel has been leading this initiative in training, administration, and to whatever degree faculty is possible with a real focus on administration. Chabad launched our anti-Semitism campus task force two and a half years ago, right? We launched these, think about this. Anti-Semitism did not start on October 7th on campus, right? And, and what's the biggest tool we have? Sarah just talked about Berkeley. I mentioned Berkeley. It's incredible. Without, I think, the backing of organizations like those on this panel to support students, it wouldn't have happened, but it's the students. It's, a, it's, a, it's the students that went to Ethan, a professor in the Department of History, that said, this is a letter we have that demands our rights be taken seriously. And people ask all the time, what can we do? What can we do? Support students' right, make them understand that they have the ability to go up and make demands. And there are two things that I think are extraordinarily important to underscore here. Sarah, I don't think mentioned them by name, but alluded to both of them. One is the student code of conduct. There is a code of conduct at every single one of these universities, and the second someone from AE Pi stands out of the line on that, they are shut down. But the rest of the students, when they attack Jews and they attack Israelis, they are not shut down. And the code of conduct exists, so we have to hold these schools to that code of conduct. And second, again, Sarah alluded to it, but it's Title VI. Title VI is an extraordinarily important tool that the federal government has the ability to enact changes and, and oversee these schools and make them change ways. 
when the latest Title VI at Middlebury College was filed, what was Middlebury College's response? Oh, we're not doing anything wrong, <laughs> right? That was the same response at the University of Vermont, who ultimately came around and made some changes. So these things are really important to understand. Absolutely. The tools are there. We need to empower students and others to use them and let faculty and administration know we will use them. Absolutely. <laughs> Just to, to mention, um, the buzzword is student conduct. Um, we read everything from each university. We have our undergraduate brothers read um, so that when they're meeting with administration, they're able to talk what's going on. Uh, many of these policies are outdated. Um, you can use your school university full name in an Instagram handle, on a Twitter handle, on a Facebook page, but when you use anti-Semitic remarks while using the school name, there's no, there's no, it's not breaking any rules. And that's something that we've been working with school administration on. They're representing your university, your name, and you're letting them say X, Y, and Z on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, that's unacceptable. And then the other big thing what we're seeing is um, student groups on campus using the school Wi-Fi um, to, po to post hate speech. And that they're starting to look at their policies with that as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, as th that as well, to understand um, what kind of punishment could happen and the, the best thing that I've seen with Jewish students um, across the board with our panelists is that we're sitting around the table talking to the presidents of the university, the VP of Student Affairs, saying, we want to work with you. We want to make life on campus better. And they've been really wanting to work with us because of that. So are you finding that, Michael, that they're engaging back with you? It takes a little bit of time. Um, 15 years ago, I thought there was maybe three or four dean of students uh, at a university. Uh, I've now realized that each university has 15 to 25 different departments, different deans that deal with different stuff, and sometimes it's the runaround. Um, but I think they're, they're afraid, and I, I've had been in conversations with a dean of students who was very, was afraid to say anything, and I said, I'm not videotaping anything. I'm not recording this conversation. Speak openly to me. I'm here to help. I want to be an advocate, and I want to help the Jewish students on campus. And she, she sat back in her chair and said, thank you. And I, I, should, I don't want to offend you. I said, my, my skin is thick. I worked with Israelis for, for nine years doing a Israeli tra uh, Israel travel, doing birthright trips. Um, my skin's thick, nothing you're gonna say is gonna offend me, but I wanna help. And she was able to then talk freely and understand that she has the same goal, she just doesn't know how to articulate how to get there and what partners there need to be to get to that. Yeah, Candace, if I can just add, I, we are seeing university administrators reach out. They, they need help, they're, they're asking for it. Often they do need to update their policies and procedures. It's one of the key things that we are finding. Um, they, they need help. There's uh, 35, I believe, active uh, Title VI cases. It might be up by today. Up today, I'm looking at the team. It goes up quickly. Um, there have never been that many open Title VI cases. This is new territory for everybody. We are seeing university administrators reach out. They are um, at times texting our Hillel directors directly, asking questions. That's that's the kind of um, you know climate that we're in. Um, and. To that point, I think that they are also very afraid, and they need to be, and that's one of the things that's important because that's how change starts to get made. Agreed. Just to, to add, you know, the students on college campuses have been going through an emotional roller coaster over the last few months. Um, they're scared, they're depressed, they're frustrated. Um, and I think most recently after the incident at Berkeley last week, if you read the posts on social media, people in general are just just, I don't know why we're still shocked, but we're shocked that things like this are happening and the world moves on and there aren't repercussions. And students are seeing this, the Jewish students are feeling this and, and bugging out, and the rest of the campus 
students and, and general community are seeing this and seeing that you can do this and get away with it. And maybe a week later, you'll get you know, sharp, sharp remarks from administration, <coughs> but uh, it's already happened and isn't making the news. And, uh, and there's this, this tolerance that's accepted in society now that is completely unacceptable. And, um, and so what we've been doing is speaking to students and you know, we spoke about the data where the, I, I can't even keep track of the number of complaints that are coming up. There are countless complaints that have not, and reports that have not been issued because students, not that they don't care anymore, but they're not seeing any action being taken with their complaints. Yes, the highest profile cases might make the news, but every day there are hundreds of incidents that are taking place that we'll never, we'll never know about. And we realize that we need to bridge this broken telephone of sorts. We need to give students a way for them to not just report their incidents, but record their incidents, so that they know that it's not just going into a black box where we you know, just up track the numbers and say, oh, look at these statistics, they're rising, but we actually empower students to know that when they share what's going on on campus, there are ways that, whether it's the administration is going to instantaneously react. We live in an instantaneous world. We, we, we cannot wait a week or a month for, to, to respond to what's going on on campus. So when we can give the students the ability to fast track to administration or fast track to the ADL, and allow them the opportunity to take immediate action and make a difference for themselves and for their campus, that's when we're going to see a difference in this campus space. We're very proud to partner with the NCRI, the National Contagion Research Institute, and we have uh, partnered with them to send representatives to each campus, not to um, not to just add to the reporting, but to actually listen to the students and give them practical next steps about what to do. For example, something that happened in Berkeley, a student might complain about it, but who is she complaining to? Is she complaining to campus police? Is she going straight to administration? Is she going to the Hillel? By the time she figures it out, her head is spinning. So we have, with our partners at NCRI, we are giving the students the ability to be an individual voice, share their, their personal stories, and then the NCRI representative is directing them. Well, this incident is more for campus police, and this incident is for the ADL to manage. And then hand-holding through the process to make sure that did the campus response, did the campus police respond? Yes, okay, this is what we're gonna do next. And by giving students the ability to take ownership over what's going on in campus is, this is going to make the change. We cannot sit by in a passive reactive reality. We need to empower the students, empower our community to take immediate action because only that is when we can make the change and really, really truly uh, build this zero tolerance culture that we so badly know and, and believe that America should and have on every single campus. And we are very excited to, to have this partnership and to work with ADL and other partners on the ground to be able to make this a reality for Jewish students and all students everywhere around, all across the country. Thank you, thank you. And I wanna build off what you just said because I think for me, in the role that I'm in at Chabad on campus where we're overseeing what happens on so many campuses, <coughs> Uh, what Miriam was just, what just, the word she mentioned so many are partners and partnering. And I think it's extraordinarily important to understand. So when Chabad on campus decided we needed to educate our rabbis and rebbitsons and our educators on, on the, this is new for us. This is not what, like, like Miriam was saying for Olami, we were focused more on Torah values, on joy of life. Uh, on, on Jewish values, on education, on history. And then all of a sudden, over the last two and a half, three years, we saw this rise in anti-Semitism. So what did we do? We reached out to Boundless. We reached out to Brandeis. We reached out to IECC. We're now partnering with ADL. We're reaching out to our partners. Hillel and Chabad have historically existed alongside each other on campus occasionally doing things together. Today, we are launching partner, partnering opportunities on campus to bring speakers to campus together for Hillel and Chabad uh, students.
it's, it, 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 and, and this empowers our students, right? This says to a student, you don't have to navigate this. Go to whoever you need to go to, whether it's Hillel, Chabad, Olami, ICC, Stand With Us, ADL, go wherever you want, and we will grab that information and we will get, we will get behind you because we're figuring out how to be better partners together and for the students. Candace, it might be helpful for this room to understand what does happen when students <coughs> report, at least in, in terms of the relationship, since we are at the ADL's Never Is Now <laughs> conference, at least to ADL, um, if I could just take a moment. Yeah, I would love to. So when any incident comes into our system, it is tagged to the region that, that we have 26 regional offices in Florida. So the regional office where that incident comes in receives the incident and then reaches out to the person who reported it. I know a lot, we hear a lot that students don't want their name attached to what they're reporting. They don't want to be perceived as a victim. So there's never, no one ever has to be the face of an incident. If someone wants to just hand it to ADL and ask us to help, we can do that. If they want to come alongside us in the journey, we can do that as well. Um, but it gives us an opportunity then to reach out to the university. Incidents come in a variety of forms. Um, obviously, some are then escalated to police or other stakeholders to take part of. But it gives us an opportunity to then go to a university and say, this is what we see happening on your campus. Here are some tools that we have that you could use, or here are some partners that we work with that can help educate you. If that is in your onboarding of uh, equity and inclusion to make sure your staff understands what anti-Semitism looks like. If that is educational programming to work with your students, we have a joint um, educational program with Hillel that is uh, any, any student can utilize. It's not just targeted to Jewish students. So to provide them with the resources to help make it better uh, and to hold their feet to the fire when necessary. Sarah mentioned our call helpline that is not something that you call that you put information into a system. But everything we'll that... We'll never <laughs> let lawyers name something again. It's so true. <laughs> everything that comes into that is reviewed by a lawyer and if necessary, action is then taken. And we've received over 500 incidents into that call helpline. So everything that comes into our system is addressed by an actual human to help make what's happening better. And just to clarify, you can report, there's a report, campushate.org, is where a student can report an incident on their campus. It's a shared partnership Hillel has with ADL and SEN, um, which helps us also alert when we do need to escalate immediately for uh, you know, uh, police or other type of security, which is something that is now a heightened part of our work, which I think was not for sure a year ago, something in terms of security being a, is nearly the conversation that we're having today. But reportcampushate.org, it comes in, uh, Hillel director gets notified through that, we work with regional offices, and there is a, a central way in which we're alerting uh, organizations in terms of what needs to happen. And while I think it's so important to like give life to the numbers that we see coming in, those numbers are important. Those numbers help us drive advocacy efforts. They help us know where we need to focus educational programming. So the more you can do to encourage people in your life to report something when they see it, certainly the more that helps cr solve the problem that we are in. Uh, we'll get to Q&A very soon. Um, I do sort of in that same vein. So these students are having all these incidents sort of thrown at them. Miriam, can you speak to the mental health? Like you talked about like the student with her head spinning in circles. Like what sort of mental health toll is this taking on our students? Sure. So like I said, after October 7th, the um, campus life changed as we knew it. And, um, you know, the initial surge of student, students who were looking to seek, for, seek answers and uh, find a community, frankly, to help them navigate what was going on, both in terms of how they processed what was happening in Israel, um, as well as what was going on on campus. Um, there was just a lot to, to take in. And so something that we pride ourselves on at Olami is um, our personal relationships that we have with students. And so our staff went into overdrive. Um, this, you know, it's, it, for us, we were, while we were doing events literally every single night of the week, our staff were also spending their days meeting one-on-one -on -one with students to help them internalize what was taking place and, and help them um, navigate individually through this, through this, whole, um, this whole last few months. Um, we didn't jump right into um, developing 
a more comprehensive plan for our students at the time because we really wanted to understand the needs on the ground. And so we took the fall semester to really listen. We did a lot of focus groups and surveys and of course speaking with the individual students to see where were the gaps, right? Like all of these organizations, um, the Jewish organizations are, are, Jew are doing unbelievable work on campus and, um, and it's been amazing to leverage our strengths as a Jewish community to really support our students. But there were certainly gaps and that is what we took the time to really, um, to really understand and see how we can play a role. And so where there were two major findings. The first was a lack of centralization. There were amazing sources of support, whether it was through mental health initiatives that Hillel um, does or Israel advocacy through Stand With Us, uh, amazing, amazing programs and events and initiatives. And yet, if a student wasn't involved in those organizations, they might not know about the opportunity. And we had an event on, on it wasn't our event, there was a Jewish event on, on uh, Penn campus. They had brought in a music survivor, uh, one of the survivors from the music festival. She was scheduled to speak twice. The first time she spoke, there, was a ha there were a handful of students in the room. They ended up canceling the second time because they were embarrassed. They, they, you know, they, it just wasn't right to this, the, the survivor. And I couldn't believe it. How could this sort of event not have people filling the room? And upon looking at it further, it was just, there was, there was a communication issue and it wasn't distributed well to the campus community because of course this sort of event, we heard from the, the survivors this morning, of course this sort of event would have been full to capacity if people knew about it. But there was a broken telephone on, of sorts on college campus life and so we realized we don't need to create new programs. We don't need to, we don't need to you know, come up with the most clever, amazing, they already exist. How can we bring them together for all the Jews on campus, those who are connected to Jewish life, but certainly, as we've seen over the last few months, those who have never been engaged with campus life, but want to now see and be part of this community. And so we've created a centralized effort on college campuses from the grassroots level, for students by students. And we've taken representatives from all the Jewish uh, organizations on campus and brought them together under a leadership board where they share their resources and they share what's going on to be able to offer a comprehensive package to their individual campus and and really highlight to the entire student body what are the offerings are to further educate and and uh, include the students um, with these important opportunities that will help them grow from this experience the second piece that we saw was that the, they're, they're, like we're, we've been saying, there's this apathy on campus that has been a shock to Jewish students because they're finding that their friends are not standing up for them in the way that we've stood up for Black Lives Matter and other sort of movements. And you know, we, we have this emphasis on administration, but the responsibility also lies on the other Jewish young adults on campus. And how can we create a positive messaging to encourage the entire campus to promote a zero tolerance culture against Jewish hatred and all Jewish hatred? And so this is through these two findings, uh, zero tolerance came about and we've launched this, this semester to centralize the efforts on, of, of Jewish organizations on campus to support our Jewish students and also to partner with our non-Jewish friends on campus and create a grassroots initiative that fosters a, a community of respect, of dialogue, of communication because these, these young adults, they are the future of the, the country. They are the future of, of the leadership of the free world. And if we miss the mark here and just look to the top to make a change, then, then we're really missing the boat. And, uh, and we've seen just in the last six weeks since we've launched a tremendous, tremendous uh, showing of interest, excitement, and um, we're very proud of this initiative. And uh, follow along on our social media pages because you'll see it continue to grow in leaps and bounds um, throughout the semester and beyond. Thank you, thank Can, you. Candace, yeah. if I can just add one thing. I, the, the mental health uh, and wellness toll is, is something that's significant and I know it weighs on 
all of the, the people up here. We were seeing this trend prior to October 7th. There's no question post-pandemic. Um, we're also seeing it in our professionals. And I think it's important to note campus professionals. I always say the Hillel directors, you know, I said my daughter's a junior at Syracuse. They're my heroes. They're the same as, as the Chabad uh, rabbis. They are doing incredibly hard work right now. This is not easy to be on campus. They're holding uh, the, both the pain of their students and they're holding their own personal pain. And so one of the things that we have thought about deeply and are uh, committed to is not only the mental health and wellness of our students, but also in our professionals, investing in both their uh, capacity to have the training and skills and knowledge to do the work they need to do, and also to have the kind of mental health support they need to continue in this space. Thank you, thank you. Um, we do need to transition to q and I want to make sure we have time to get to your questions. Before we do, so I'm, I'll go to the next slide. As a reminder, we're taking Q&A through the app or through a note card. If you need a note card, perhaps raise your hand and Beth can get to you. But before I jump into that, I would love for you to just succinctly each say something to be hopeful about on campus. Uh, wow, there is so much to be, there's so much to be hopeful about. So I'll very quickly say that within every single one of us, and I truly believe that we're born with a light, right? We're born with a light. And the more we come together as Jewish people, and the more that we partner and support each other, the more we're connected to our history, to our Judaism, to our values of Torah, the brighter that light gets. And we collectively are shining a bright on campus, a light on campus that is brighter than ever. And, and there's one thing I want to add to this that re didn't come up yet on, on, on the panel, and, and I know we all feel very strongly about this. Our collective commitment to Israel and educating students about Israel and educating our professionals about Israel, this summer Chabad on campus is holding our executive director conferences in Israel. Because if we can educate the educators and we can get them comfortable with all these topics, we can connect that even further to students. So the hope is there, the hope is great. It's beyond hope, it's success. And we're achieving a greater connected Judaism through all that we're doing. Absolutely. Um, I just wanna add a few things to Tom. Um, I said it before and I'll say it again, our students are incredible. Um, the young people uh, that are on campus today, um, I have a colleague who often says he, you know, he was born 20 years too late. He wishes he could be on campus in this moment. They, you know, for all the stories you're hearing, they are standing up, they are loud, they are proud, um, and they need to know that we're all behind them. Um, I can point to a young woman, uh, Tessa, who is a student government president at University of California, Santa Barbara. Many of you may have seen the incident. Um, in which she was a really vicious campaign against her as a student government president, um, and it targeted her specifically. She didn't back down. She was incredible in the way that she stood up. She participated in Hillel's Israel Insight Fellowship just last summer, um, which really helps train student leaders and to think about sort of how to be the <coughs> advocates and be part of the campus life to talk positively around Israel. Um, and these types of skills that our young people are gaining they really are incredible. So I have incredible hope for the future. I really think that if we can all show, the Jewish world can show that they're behind our college students today, we're gonna to be really, we're gonna be okay. It's been a, a very challenging last few months. Um, and at the same time, if you take a moment, we as a Jewish people have never been in a stronger position. We we have a state, a Jewish state. We have a Jewish army fighting for the state of Israel, fighting for the Jewish people. And, and we as a global Jewish community have never been stronger. And this is something that young Jews everywhere around the world are seeing. And it is inspiring them to connect with their Judaism and to Jewish community and Jewish life in a way that prior to October 7th, that to radar them. was not quite there. And this is an incredible moment for the Jewish people to revive that Jewish spark amongst Jews everywhere, to get in touch with their Jewish identity and build their Jewish pride. 
And it's an incredible moment for the Jewish people, one that will continue to strengthen us as a people to create a strong and vibrant Jewish future. So there's, there's tremendous hope, and it's an honor to be here representing Jewish campus life because this is the Jewish future, and there's so much good in store, and it, the best is yet to come. We talk about being loud and proud on campus. Uh, we currently have 10,000 of these T-shirts um, all over no, campus. Um, do, do, eight, we do we get? Do we get? So Greek. <laughs> a a pi stands with Israel, and it's not just brothers wearing these T-shirts. It's our allies wearing these T-shirts as well. Our goal is that it, next year it's not just 10,000 students; it's 20,000 students. Second is philanthropy. Since October seventh. AAPI brothers have raised $600,000 for Israel organizations. $600,000. And they're not stopping. Our goal is to hit a million dollars before June 1st. And lastly, I mentioned we have chapters in Israel. And right after October 7th, we did these webinars with our brothers in Israel. And it was important for the undergrads in the United States to hear from our brothers, hear what's going on. And the Israel brothers said, don't worry about us. We need you fighting for Israel on campus. Your voice is important and you need to use your voice and don't stop using your voice. And the brothers in the States go, what do you need from us? Said, hopefully we can have a rush class this semester. School is delayed two, three, four months. And what happens? We have the largest rush class in AAPI in Israel in our 16-year history of being there. We have more brothers wanting to be in a part of AAPI on campus in Israel than ever before. And we're, we're coming together, both in the United States, Canada, Israel, the UK, to represent AAPI and help with the Jewish students on campus and our allies on campus and our school administration on campus. Thank you. Thank you. So now as we turn to Q&A, I appreciate all of your questions. I'm going to do my best to see what is here, see what is here, and ask what seem to be recurring themes. Uh, one thing I do want to share, a number of people have asked about hearing from the students. We will have a panel tomorrow that is students, so we would love for you to join that as well. It is the second breakout session tomorrow in the morning uh, where we will hear from three students who are currently on college campuses. Uh, here here and here, um, one of the most recurring questions relates to professors. So I'm just going to ask the one that has the most votes on the <laughs> app. How do we address professors that are spewing anti-Semitism and disinformation in their classrooms and online? How do we draw the line between academic freedoms, freedom of speech, and blatant bigotry and anti-Semitism? <laughs> you, you'll, you'll see everyone's hesitation and actually I, I think I, I want to pause it and, and mm -hmm. faculty is a real issue there is no question um, the part of that is by the way faculty have codes of conduct uh, we don't talk enough about that so some of this is in terms of how are we working in terms of their say we talked about student code of conducts how are we enforcing faculty code of conducts that means that if a faculty is teaching a math class, they are not allowed to change the way in which they teach that math class to relate to what's happening in Israel. These are places in which those are acts of anti-Semitism. Those can be reported and there can be, again, this is where the legal helplines and the tools can reinforce it. Um, there's no question, it's not a simple answer on how we're gonna address the faculty issues. I will not pretend to even play our lawyer on TV to give you the academic freedom of speech versus hate speech. There is a real difference. Um, we are really lucky to have some incredible legal, Hillel has a general counsel who's an expert in Title VI. We work in collaboration with the Brandeis Center, which has an expert in Title VI. They are really trained to help us address these issues. The key here is this shouldn't be allowed. Students should be reporting it, and the Jewish community will be addressing it. Thank you. Um, another recurring theme in here is how do we educate our high schoolers. I want to share that we will have about 800 high schoolers here tomorrow going through their own track and participating in our sessions as well. So we are certainly working with high schools. 
Uh, and our Words to Action program uh, gets into high schools in the, in the senior, in junior and senior years to help them start to understand their Jewish identity and some of the things they may face on campus. And the last thing I will touch on quickly that came in is uh, people who have heard about the report card that ADL is doing. We are assessing uh, a number of campuses right now. We are actively in that assessment process. And about mid-April, we will release a report card that will be available online for everyone to see how universities are responding and combating anti-Semitism on their campus. Um, my screen went dark. So another sort of common theme um, Oh, I just moved, was students who, Jewish students who are supporting a ceasefire how, and, and JVP. How are we reaching out to our Jewish students who are perhaps understanding the issue differently than many of us? Look, I think we are one Jewish people and we have a lot of different opinions. I know that's a shock, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and, and there are gonna be members of every single community that stand on one end of the spectrum, the other are in the middle. And, and, and we have to let them know that we love them as Jewish people. And it doesn't matter what they think or where they are in that spectrum, we are gonna love them as Jewish people. And then, <laughs> then we figure out how to sit down and, and, and invite them sometimes start with them on a dialogue of something that isn't so, so bombastic, something that isn't tearing us apart at the sides, and talk about a class that we enjoy together or something like that. Be, it, ease into these conversations, but I will tell you one thing, and I know we talk about this a lot with our colleagues at Hill. you cannot go after them and say, we're gonna convince you you're wrong, we're gonna, that isn't gonna work. We know that isn't gonna work. So let's approach it thoughtfully. Let's figure out how to engage on a friendly basis. We, we, we are not, we, we don't show up to counter protest. We, we show up to watch, see what's going on, and then figure out how to engage intellectually and intelligently in conversations with individuals, not with mobs. Just to, to echo your, your sentiments, um, what's the joke, three Jews in a room, 100 opinions? So. There's, there's going to be um, you know, different, different mindsets and opinions amongst just our Jewish students on campus, let alone the rest of community. But what we, what we need to iterate in a positive way is education. So many Absolutely. young adults are getting their information from TikTok and other forms of social media, and we don't even have the opportunity to share, I'm not even talking about the other side, but the, the neutral perspective of, of what's going on and giving historical accuracy and, and building, helping them build a foundation of knowledge and education to really go about making the right opinion on the matter. And so that's been a very important focus of uh, Olami. Um, prior to October 7th, we had a very successful social media internship program um, called the Daily Schmooze. And the goal of it was to share the positives about Judaism in a very happy, neutral way that was catered to the college campus community, Jews and non-Jews alike. And in the same vein, we've continued it after October 7th to shed light on what's going on and give um, just the, the, um, the basic education and knowledge for students to build their own foundations of truth to go out and make their own opinions, but we need to be able to share that in a constructive way so that we're not only relying on TikTok for them to, to, to create their opinions, but we're giving them really the full scope of what's, what the, the facts on the ground are to be able to, uh, to make their opinions and then hold true to them where, wherever it lies, but making sure that they have the opportunity to really make a, an educated opinion. Thank you. So I'm going to go with two more questions. Uh, this one is from a student in the audience, so I feel like I should get precedence. As a current Jewish student on college campus, when we attempt to engage with the individuals with opposing views, we are not listened to or taken seriously because they say our facts are untrue propaganda. How should students respond to this? 
So a, a couple of things that I think, and, and Tom alluded to it, I mean, part of this question is how do you engage in civil dialogue, right? How do you uh, have disagreement with uh, across difference? Like, how do you engage in these conversations? So part of this is teaching students, at, and by the way, administration, the tools in which you can actually have these kinds of dialogue across <laughs> difference. Um, so I, I want to really stress what Tom put out there. We work with some great organizations that are training both our Hillel professionals and training our student leaders, sort of how to be effective communicators when you have dialogue across difference and, and where in which you're receiving somebody who's gonna be receptive and open. And then I think to Miriam's point, there is this education question. Too many of our young people are starting you know, from this place of, of TikTok and where is the authentic information I'm getting from. It's part of why Hillel really focused on bringing experts, out, external experts, uh, Den Ambassador Dennis Ross, Dave Makovsky, uh, uh, Gaith Alamari, like different types of educators that students themselves can, you know, they can then use that and say, I learned this at, and who did I receive it from? And, and part of that has been really important. We did some pulse surveys uh, over the last three months, and one of the things it's shown is that the number one thing we're seeing from students that they want is as real education. So I would encourage the students both to be able to, you know, authentically hold your own with your own voice, and also to be able to, you know, rely on experts that all of these organizations are bringing onto campus to help validate uh, what is factual information. Thank you. Um, just, just one more thing to add. I saw a very funny reel on uh, on Instagram. Um, it was it was contrasting um, the Palestinian cry to action right from the river to the sea. We're all familiar with this um, to the the Jewish call to action, which is often. Wait, let me give you the history. In 1948, this happened, and then this happened, and wait, 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 I have more to share with you. At the end of the day, you can't reason with certain individuals. And as much as we want to be able to have dialogue and communication, it's just, it's, it, I think uh, someone on the panel earlier today said, you could have a PhD and you can also have an SOB, right? There's just, <laughs> it, that is the case. But what we're, we need to focus on is the neutrals. And it's the students who have not yet formed their opinion. And that is where the education piece comes into play, not just for the Jewish students, but for the non-Jewish students on campus. And this is something that Olemi and the other organizations on, on this panel um, have, and AAPI for sure, um, has done extraordinary work and continue to do extraordinary work to educate, educate, educate. Thank you. So last question, and we can go down the line again, everyone can answer. What can rabbis, donors, community members, people in this room do to support college students? Probably the easiest question, as far as I'm concerned. Stand up, stand proud, stand loud, use your voice. Jonathan said this morning in the plenary session, use your checkbook, use your Congress people, use every thing you have available to you to make yourself heard and put that voice and put that support behind students. I, I'm gonna make a quick caveat because I'm sitting here and I realize we have Olami, Hillel, and Chabad, and hopefully soon to be uh, AEPI also. It, I, I'd be bereft not to say we have great partners also in Israel. We are all partners with an organization called Mosaic Capital. Mosaic Capital announced today a $1.1 million fund to fund small organizations that deal with students on campus and these issues, right? There's more available out there than ever. Access it. If you don't know who to talk to, call one of us. Reach out and say, how do I do more? We will tell you. Yeah, Tom said it excellently. The just two things I want to add to that is one, check in with your college student if you have one on campus, if it's your child or grandchild. But, but don't start with, I saw this on. <laughs> yeah, right. Ask them how they're doing first. So one, let them lead the conversation. Um, too often we actually bring the, the issues to them rather than hearing from them. And that the same goes for your campus professional, whomever it is that you're connected with. Start by checking in on them. They're doing incredible work and they need to know, and I said this already and I'll say it again, and what Tom said, that they need to know that the Jewish community stands behind them unequivocally. A few years ago, uh, you know, at the end of year, we're, we're at OLME, we were tracking our numbers, and we started noticing that although we were doing amazing work on campus, our numbers were not increasing. And we tried different programs and, 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 and uh, events and initiatives to try to increase this involvement. And then year after year, it was kind of, we, were, we hit a glass ceiling. And we realized it's because 
we are, the glass ceiling is a result of staffing. And we don't have enough staff to go around the world. We have 300 locations. We, just, we, we don't have enough staff to man um, not just the, the locations, but to build those personal relationships that we hold so dearly to, to our mission. <coughs> and and we, we were kind of at a standstill. What should we do? How, we, we know what our mission is. It's, it's, it's to build this, this Jewish pride and, and uh, engagement amongst young Jews. But how can we reach it? And we realize, wait a minute, we are sitting on the best asset. We have the Jewish community. And how can we tap into this asset to help us with our goals, to, to help young Jews connect to community and, um, and have that personal relationship? It's through our Jewish community. And so we, sent up the, we set up this robust mentorship program where we have thousands of mentorships uh, couples set up throughout the world with students connected with Jewish community members who are there to look out for them. And, and it's been an unbelievable program. And this, I say this all because this is exactly what we have here today. We have an army out there. All of you here, you're all proactive in this space, and we need to rally up the rest of the Jewish community to come out there and help us fight this fight for the Jewish students on campus, for Israel, and for the Jews all over the world. And if we can do that, activate our people, we will be in a better place, and we'll be happier and stronger for that. Over the last few months, I've seen a lot of our alumni reach out, what's going on with my chapter? How can I help my chapter? And um, we want to hear from them. So we've seen a lot of small town hall conversations with current undergraduate brothers with the alumni. And I always tell alumni, if you want to go back to campus, we'll help bring you back to campus and you can see what's going on. Um, the students need you. Um, as we've all said, the students need our support more than ever right now. And if you don't have a uh, connection to college students on campus or an organization on college campus, please let one of us know. We're, we're more than happy to help get you connected to a campus uh, in your community, in your state, et cetera. But the 18 to 22 year olds, the 18 to, to 26 year olds, the grad students, they need us right now. Um, and I recommend standing up and going to campus and seeing what the Jewish students are doing right now. Um, they need you and we all need your support as well. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you all for hanging with us for a few extra minutes. We appreciate your time and being here and thank you to my panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you, Candace.